What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this video series, Speaking Freely, we'll be talking from time to time with thought leaders and players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Catherine Culleton Gonzalez, senior counsel at Demos, joins us in the studio. talking today with Kathy Culleton Gonzalez from Demos, an organization that is devoted to voting rights, racial equity, and uh, strengthening American democracy. Kathy, I'm very interested in your views about free speech in the context of the work you're doing to build and preserve democracy in the United States. Yeah, right. Well, we actually, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I'm a civil rights lawyer, right. a civil and human rights lawyer. And so defend You've the Constitution. You've been working in that area for many years. Yeah, for about 23 years or so, for a while. Um, right. And so I'm a big believer in free speech and the First Amendment of the Constitution, the First Amendment of our Bill of Rights. But as a civil rights lawyer, as a person who um, needs to stop discrimination and make sure that there is equal access for people of color, which is basically my job description, I've also you know, seen many instances where the idea of free speech has gone too far, or folks who um, are making racist speech or um, infringing on other people's rights um, to to equal access to voting rights, to equal access to education, um, and you know, even in public discourse, has gone too far. Let, mm -hmm. Let's take that apart a little bit. I'd mm -hmm. like to understand how you would um, how you would implement that that point of view. When would you? What, what sorts of speech would you think should be constrained in some fashion? Well, in the case of free speech, the legal answer, it always depends on the context, course, right? So um, it's a different situation when you have NFL players versus the president making speech, right? Or right. a government official making speech, or for example, uh, the Confederate flag on license plates. So even right. this very conservative Supreme Court said that the state of Texas and other states can, um, can uh, prohibit um, uh, applications to put the Confederate flag on, on license plates because right. that's you part involved, of it. You were involved in that case. Right? Uh, no, I just commented on it on NPR. So I right. did an interview around that. And, you know, from my point of view, um, the Confederate flag, of, as we've seen so recently in Charlottesville, um, and, you know, the monuments and many symbols of the Confederacy, you know, uh, are very much associated with illegal racial discrimination and with actual fear. So there's a couple of other rights at stake in, in those in those instances. Instances. So just to break it down, if you're, for example, in a school setting, um, in a school setting, there's the right to equal access to education. The Supreme Court decided that a long time ago right. in Brown versus, versus the Board of Education. Um, and there's a line of cases talking about equal access to education, education being the foundation of democracy. Um, if you infringe the right to equal access to education, the damage is lifetime. It's, it, it, it really harms a person more Absolutely. than other sorts of of of, um, of infringements, or it, um, and so therefore, in the balance of rights between the Fourteenth Amendment right to equal access and the First Amendment right to free speech, we see that schools not only can but should restrict hate speech uh, because that actually uh, uh, creates a hostile environment for education for children of color and their and their families. So you would mm -hmm. say schools at all levels should restrict hate restrict hate speech, including colleges and universities. Colleges and universities also may. So the the rights to the, the rights of the individual student and the context actually depends a lot with whether it's a pi a private school or a public school. And you know the age, um, you know the educational environment. And I'm quoting Supreme Court cases. You know, um, there's you're allowed to have restrictions on for the fundamental principles of public education um, to protect them and also to 
protect the privacy of students and also to, for what's considered appropriate. And so what's appropriate, um, what's appropriate for the education environment varies greatly between, you know, my son who's in second grade and someone who's in college, right? right. So, um, well, let's, let's talk so, for the moment about colleges and universities okay. and, and some examples. Um, you, you mentioned the Confederate flag before yes. and the famous Texas license plate case. Yes. Um, do you think that it's appropriate for colleges and universities to restrict the display of the Confederate flag, for example, in the windows of student residence halls, which is, mm -hmm. I think, a common problem that a number of colleges and universities have had to deal with. People just deciding whether out of some belief or just out of mischief or mm -hmm. rebellion, uh, displaying the Confederate flag in their dorm windows. How would, how would you deal with that? I think after the Texas license plate case that colleges and universities actually have arguably more of a right to restrict that. And again, it depends on the context. But if you want to have an educational environment that's free and equally open to all students of all backgrounds, um, if that Confederate flag is provoking fear and, pro and is in the context of other, other discriminatory issues, like uh, you know, here in the in in our, in our in our own area, at University of Maryland, at American University, my alma mater. You know, we've seen nooses. We've seen a lot more um, a provocative and dangerous types of speech. And so, if within that context, the Confederate flag is something that's uh, that that's seen as causing fear and reasonably does cause fear among students and does create a discriminatory and hostile environment, then yes, it can. That that speech can be. Um, can be limited. Um, I, you know, of course, would urge everyone to be cautious about that because everyone has the right to free speech. You don't leave it uh, when you walk into, you know, a college or a university or even an elementary school. Um, but that's uh, something that the, um, the Confederate flag being displayed is something that could be could be stopped. Um, you know, there, there uh, we, we don't see on the grounds that it could be hurtful to people. That it could be, be hurtful intimidating to people. and. Uh, and, and make people uncomfortable. Right, so for example, American University could create a policy that um, you know they're going to investigate the nooses, they're going to investigate the other forms of racist speech, and from now on, um, things that are indicia of of, the, of white supremacy, um, you know, can no longer be displayed on campus. That could include swastikas and the Confederate flag. Now there mm -hmm. are a number of universities, mm -hmm. public ones, state mm -hmm. universities by and large, that have found themselves, that describe themselves as powerless in the face of certain um, white supremacist, racist people mm -hmm. who want to come and speak. Richard Spencer is the mm -hmm. one of the more notorious people who does this. He has a, an office actually in Alexandria, Virginia mm -hmm. for his um, movement. And uh, the University of Florida recently said it, it couldn't stop him from speaking. That it, it, it as a public university, I, I uh, my understanding is, it felt that it had no rules it could apply, no mm -hmm. to, that would, without making content-driven restrictions, which most public universities think they're not allowed to do. That they, mm -hmm. the restrictions have to apply equally to all. So, what what is your prescription for how to deal with that situation at a place like University of Florida? So I think that they are probably right on the state of the law right now, but the state of the law may change. Obviously, we have you know a more conservative judiciary coming forward in this era, but I would say even the Roberts Court has said that you know the state of Texas doesn't have to put the Confederate flag on a license plate. Uh, they don't have to do that. So I think that they're not necessarily completely powerless, that they do have some leeway. You would have to have a very strong case showing that um, in the post-Charlottesville environment that this type of speech is likely to lead to violence, is likely to be, to be highly disruptive to the educational environment, and is likely to lead to equal protection violations, you know, right. in order to make that rule. So, well, it, it's, um, certainly, it's certainly disruptive. Yes. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars in extra police protection mm -hmm. to prevent violent clashes from breaking out on, on some of the public campuses where where he and other people appear. Mm -hmm. um, so disruption, I think, is, is clear. The, the, the question, I, uh, I, again, to take it to another level, is if University of Florida, for one example, mm -hmm. decides that it has to let Richard Spencer speak, what are the rights of people 
than to disrupt him from speaking. How do you how do you resolve that issue? Because most places say that there is not something known as the heckler's veto. You can't allow the hecklers mm -hmm. and the, dis the the people who disrupt the speech to decide what speech is acceptable and what's not. Well, I guess from the point of view of, uh, let me answer from the point of view sure. of the university and then from the point of view okay. of the protester. So right. from the point of view of the university, you want to make sure that the rules are applied equally to everyone. Right. So the same rules that would apply to Richard Spencer and white supremacists coming to speak, that you may not disrupt the educational environment and you may not create um, an environment that's hostile, that violates equal protection, you know, would also apply to anybody in the audience. Um, and the rules of the forum just need to be consistently applied. And so, um, you know, while you wouldn't um, let Richard Spencer come in, um, you know, let's say uh, armed or with a gun or, um, or, or calling for an armed revolution, you know, you shouldn't uh, let there, the same thing happen among the hecklers too. There so. are, of course, states where it is now legal has been authorized by the state legislatures for people to carry weapons on college and university campuses. Right. So I suppose, theoretically, I don't know whether Richard Spencer is armed. I think he usually counts on other people to be armed who are supporting him. Exactly. But he could theoretically uh, say that he feels he needs a gun to protect himself mm -hmm. when he goes onto one of these state university campuses. I, I, I the, the the question that I think is on a lot of people's minds, mm -hmm. and the official answer is one thing, but then a lot of people feel concerned about what can they do? What can they get away with? So Richard Spencer's in a hall speaking. Mm -hmm. He is saying racist, anti-supremacist, I mean white, white supremacist, supremacist. Oh. anti-Semitic remarks. Mm -hmm. um, what? What would you counsel the members of the audience to do if they're offended, they're hurt, they're threatened, they're upset by this? Right. Um, I think that there are a number of different things that people can do. Um, and, you know, some people choose to do civil disobedience and protest in that manner. And right. so, um, you know, consciously violating a, a rule um, is something that, um, you know, people, it's, our country was founded on this right to revolution, on civil disobedience, Good and that's point. how many changes have happened in our society, is, you know, the, the, the marches and but the civil rights movement. But then they have to be prepared movement. to be arrested. Yes, and that. so to take the arrest and, and use it as a form of protest, just as Dr. King did from Birmingham jail, just as folks did during the civil rights movement. So I think my counsel would be to make a conscious decision if you want to do civil disobedience, um, and then also to decide, is it worth, um, you know, going to protest, I mean, again, this depends on the context. Is, is it worth going to protest, you know, basically to shut down that person's speech? We've seen that also recently in Tennessee, and I think That's also right. at University of Florida, where, you know, the side that is um, anti-white supremacist, the side that is for American democracy and equality and against racism and anti-Semitism um, has, you know, had a, a larger turnout than the side of the white supremacists. So right. that's and where we see like a their problem. Back on, they turned their backs on the speaker and, yes. and shouted him down so that he could not get his message out. Um, this is not, mm -hmm. the, the, of course, free speech is never neat and clean and orderly and easy. Exactly. But this seems particularly me a messy way to decide who gets to be heard sometimes. Yes, it, it does. And actually going back to something that you said too, it seems like the state legislatures have allowed guns to be brought into universities, but the Constitution is superior, right? So the First Amendment is going to be superior to that. If you could argue that bringing a gun is a form of free speech, I don't think it is. Um, but then also the rights to equal protection and, um, and, and, and all of the rights that students have in that public space that is a public university, right, right um, are there as well too. So you can, so, so it's messy. You can say, you know, we're not going to have arms in here because we want this to be, you know, a true public forum where there is debate of all sides of the issue. Uh, we have a, a strong interest in violence not erupting. Um, everybody's going to follow the same rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so here are the rules for the speaker and also for the audience members. Um, and so, so people are going to push it with forms of civil disobedience, but that would be, um, you know, the ideal of, of, of the public marketplace of ideas playing out with equal access for all folks, one, right? One thing that many uh, colleges and universities have done in recent years is say, well, if we're going to allow someone to speak who 
if we don't feel we have much choice by allowing this person to speak, mm -hmm. we're going to at least require that she or he must answer questions after speaking, must, must uh, agree to engage in dialogue with the other side. Is that a reasonable solution to this problem? Sure, it's a public forum, but the rules of the forum, the time, place, and manner it's called, are something that time, place, um, and manner restrictions. Yeah, yes. those those types of restrictions are fine. So that would be a manner restriction that a person, you know, cannot come in and and have a one-sided um, uh, owning the space, right? Owning the place, um, and, and and in particular from. This can't come from the government on down either. It can't come from one political right, party or right. the other on down. Good point. Uh, Do you think that's a sort of, I mean, if Richard, what if Richard Spencer, or uh, we don't need to focus exclusively on him, some other controversial speaker doesn't want to answer questions? Uh, how do we, and, and we only find out when his or her speech is over, mm -hmm. Ann Coulter would be another person mm -hmm. who's provoked some controversy. We only find out then that she does not want to answer questions. Mm -hmm. What do we do? What sort of situation? Can't force her to answer questions. Obviously. No, but it should be clear up front what's expected and the time, place, and manner regulations or restrictions, as you as you say. And you know, she, the, the, I, in, in that case, you would have the right not to invite her back because she is not following the the appropriate time, place, and ah, manner so restrictions. so that would be you. You didn't. You you could say a university, for example, could say. You didn't respect our ground rules the first right, time you were here. Right. So now we're not going to have you back again. Do you mm -hmm. think the courts would uphold that as far as, as you can predict? Um, I know you know better than to try to predict court decisions. But. No, I mean, uh, this is a great question. So I think that um, as long as the ground rules are reasonable, the court would uphold. Uh, reasonable, reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, and then another another ground rule that we have to always keep in mind is um, equal protection. Right, so uh, we have to make sure that they're evenly applied to every speaker. Right, like every speaker has to do the same well, thing. Let, let, let's back up. Um, you said that there is some speech that you think is just hurtful, some some hate speech, and that it it. Uh, contributes to a kind of disorder in and of itself, mm -hmm. that speech. Um, how would you, what, what kind of ground rules would you set? What sort of, how would you classify the speech that should be constrained because it's in conflict with other rights, as you, as you put it? Well, the, again, the answer depends, or right? sure. it always depends, it on, the, always on, depends. A, on the context. Right. But you know, very clearly in the K through 12 environment, especially in elementary schools, um, you know, we're living in an era since the election of a white supremacist or someone who has and has a person who has unleashed, um, you know, all kinds of hate speech that. Um, you know, hate speech has increased ex exponentially um, since the election of Donald Trump. Um, and in the K through 12 environment, actually, the most hate speech that's been documented in our country since that election has been um, among elementary in the K through 12 environment. Sec the second highest, this is the Southern Poverty Law Center document. The second highest is actually in what's called businesses and restaurants and um, stores. Mm -hmm. And then the third highest is in colleges and universities. Now, in the K through 12 environment, that's think, horrifying. Uh, it's when you think about it. terrible. And just think about you know young children going to school and hearing things about themselves and their friends that depend on the color of their skin, not the quality of their person. So public schools and private schools have every right and arguably an obligation um, to stop hate speech um, in, in the K through 12 environment. It's that damaging to the child's future and it's that damaging to the, to, to the right to equal access to education. Um, there are you know, some, um, I, I, I would say also, not only hate speech, but hostile and discriminatory speech, right? So, um, you know, hate speech is is a legal term of art. That's, you know, sort of the worst, right? And then we have oh, things yeah. that are like bullying and teasing and, um, you know, um, uh, dividing up the classroom according to gender and all kinds of things that shouldn't be done in the K through 12 environment. I mean, that's an example that also applies in, 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 in colleges and universities. So there's much more leeway and obligations, um, especially in this era in the K through 12 environment. And we can also talk about the university environment, but um, you know, I, my, my advice would be, you know, of course, to uphold the First Amendment, but realize that 
um, you know, you, you can't just go into a school discriminating against fellow students and, and, and folks who work for the school, um, you know, can't do that. The school system can't do it. But, you know, even individuals who come into the school environment can't do that. And you would say this is that. equally true in public and private schools? Yes, I would say so. So um, that's getting trickier, the idea of, um, um, you know, access to private education or the rules against discrimination in private spaces. Um, you know, the Department of Justice is changing uh, everything that sure. it can to, 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 to try to interpret things more towards um, letting white supremacy or letting, you know, there be, there be um, you know, just any old thing apply any place um, as opposed to... Um, reasonable restrictions on time, place, and manner, manner to protect other constitutional rights, um, including the right to equal access to, and again, because it's education and not just equal access to a club, um, you know, there's, there's heightened ability to, to restrict hate speech I, and discriminatory speech. I, I teach undergraduate seminars on free speech mm -hmm. in two places, one case to first year students, first semester first year students, and the other case to older students, juniors and seniors mostly. And, in college. And if you were talking to my students today, mm -hmm. they would say to you, ah, but there's a slippery slope here. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you know where to draw the line? How do you know what constitutes speech that you want to restrict and what does not? And who decides? Right, right. Th th those are great questions. It sounds like you have some some wonderful students, and I think it's a very important question. <laughs> um, and you know, as a proponent of free speech myself, I don't want to go down that slippery slope. But um, it sounds vague when we're talking about it. Depends on the facts, and it depends on the context. But once you start laying out the facts and applying the rules to the facts, you know, we're going to see that there is a limit to the restrictions. We're going to see where the restrictions fall. Um, it does, you know, matter what's happening in the world around us, right? It does matter, um, you know, for example, uh, some of the work that I've done has been for immigrant families and uh, what's being said to immigrant kids and the obligation of the schools to keep their information private so that they're not terrified. I mean, that context changed, right. um, you know, over the, over the last decade and then radically with the election of, of President Trump, right? That it can cause a lot of fear and inequality for there to be uh, attacks on immigrant students, even verbal attacks on immigrant students. So. Um, what you want to do is just think of it very analytically and you'll figure out that this slippery slope has an end. So we have a balance of the First Amendment with other rights, um, the right to public safety, the right to equal protection, um, and the uh, reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, especially those that are important for public so safety. So equal protection comes to play in the 14th Amendment? Yes. Yes, it does. Equal, so that all citizens have equal protection under the law? As it turns out, every person every is entitled person, to equal protection person, under the law. Not just citizens, not just also citizens. residents of the country yes. who may not yet be. And particularly in the school environment. The right. Supreme Court decided that in the um, Plyler versus Doe case in 1976. Um, right. But also in this era, we've seen you know, travel bans and all kinds of unconstitutional things that have been struck down by courts because every person has um, fundamental rights. And citizens have. Um, higher rights, the right to vote, for example, but every person who is within the territory and jurisdiction of the United States has a fundamental right to due process and equal protection before the so, law. So what happens when somebody says to you, Demos sounds like a wonderful organization, protecting democracy, enhancing democracy, mm -hmm. and your goals are excellent, but are you not running the risk of controlling controlling people's speech in order to make others feel better. Is that, is that not a potential problem? So I think that's exactly where the limit of the law is. And you know, keep in mind that I've been speaking about public schools. I understand and that. so right. the context you know, matters. And um, right. um, so um, we, are, we do believe in free speech. The First Amendment is very important for our democracy. In fact, it's one of the um, fundamental rights that, that we use in voting rights litigation. The First Amendment right to express yourself by voting should not be restricted right. um, by gerrymandering and these, and these other forms of voter suppression. Are, you know? there, are, there, are there threats to people's right, are there new threats to people's right to vote these days in, in America? Yes, there are. Since I, uh, something that's been part of American history from the foundation of our country that um, 
Um, you know, certain people weren't even allowed to, to be citizens and vote. Right. And I would say, um, you know, since the civil rights movement in 1965 and the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, um, things were always tough, but they were getting be progressively better. Mm -hmm. And um, you know some legal structural things have changed. The Supreme Court struck down some of the protections of the Voting Rights Act in, in yes, uh, the did. Shelby case. Right. Um, so we um, uh, we don't have a Department of Justice review of voting changes in states that have a history of discrimination in voting, uh, particularly you know the Deep South or actually Texas all the way to Virginia is where those those checks and balances came in under the Voting Rights Act. And we've also just seen, you know, wild allegations and unfounded allegations of voter fraud, That's particularly about people of color, to justify right, voter ID laws, which 7% um, of Americans don't have the type of ID that, that these 7% of eligible Americans do not have the type of ID that, Even you know, though they are eligible to even vote. Even though they are citizens of voting age and eligible to vote. And, the, and, and there's also some racial disparities in that too. So um, when states cut back on um, access to the right to vote through these sort of modern day poll taxes and well, modern day literacy tests, they, right. they, they surgically target African Americans. I mean, quoting a federal court and, and, and stating that, and have also surgically targeted Latinos, and I'm, I'm again quoting federal courts. So, well, voting okay. is a form of speech, of course. Yes. And so, uh, but you you think these allegations that the president and others have made about millions and mm. millions of people voting fraudulently are groundless? They're groundless. They're patently false. I mean, they're, you know, just um, allegations made to make people fear, uh, you know, the real fraud is restricting the right to vote. And, you know, we don't see the president talking about, you know, Russian hacking of our elections or other other no, other types of issues. Instead, we have these false allegations. We know that they're false because for the last decade, um, you know, the Department of Justice um, intensely investigated all sorts of allegations of voter fraud. And there's been study after study of, um, you know, every court case and every allegation that came out in the press. And the, 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 the actual amount of even the real allegations that are made, as opposed to the ones just thrown out in, in the press, is much smaller. And then mm -hmm. the ones that are even prosecuted, it's 0.001%. It's, it's uh, you know, a phantom voter fraud. It doesn't have any impact. On, on the election, and everyone wants of election course, a integrity. Of, a lot of jokes are told about voter fraud. I right. Mean, it's always said that Lyndon Johnson somehow stole his election to the Senate originally, and that we not, none of us would know his name if he hadn't fraudulently been elected to the Senate. Or it was of, often said that the late Mayor Daley of Chicago mm -hmm. uh, made it possible for John F. Kennedy to be elected president. Uh, do, do we know whether there was any validity to those allegations? I actually don't know the answer to those two instances, but I know about you know every allegation that was made from 2000 to 2008, and um, the great majority of them were completely invalid. I know that you know I, I did a case in Florida in 2012 um, when um, Rick Scott alleged there were you know hundreds of thousands of non-citizens on the voting rolls and voting, and um, as, and we, we actually stopped them from purging. As it turned out, one person who was Canadian voted. There weren't hundreds of thousands of non-citizens voting. And uh, the allegation you know, got smaller and smaller and smaller over time as they were challenged one through litigation. One person who was Canadian. That's it's, not it's, usually who's accused of Right, right, and we hear the dog whistles or the or or the the actual outright racism between you know right. these accusations. So, you know, I would you know say I'm a believer in the First Amendment because all the folks who have been wrongfully accused of of voter fraud, uh, you know, we all have the right to. Uh, express ourselves politically through right. the First Amendment, right? That's that's a, a, a fundamental part of our democracy, um, and and in many other ways too. Right. So I'm not I'm not for overly restricting the First Amendment at all. Just saying that it it intersects with other rights, right. and as long as we're analytical about it, we're not going to carry it too far. Right. Uh, so we're in a period right now of tension around mm -hmm. free speech, yes. national tension, not just colleges and universities and civil society, state legislatures are taking extraordinary measures to pass laws that uh, are questionable, of questionable constitutionality, I think, mm -hmm. restricting protests and so on. Um, I, I, get, I guess I want to ask you an unanswerable question. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you have an answer that no one else has thought of. 
Where, where do you see this settling down? I mean, that's why we have a free speech project at Georgetown University mm -hmm. now, to try to assess the state of free speech in America today and make some new suggestions, come up with some frameworks, perhaps, for, for civil discussion and mm -hmm. return to civility. Um, do you, are you hopeful that that might happen? Would you encourage us to do this, or would you just say, give it up and, and, and fight for more basic rights? I mean, what, where, where, do you, where do you think this is all going to go? I think it's an incredibly important issue. It's the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights of you know the foundation of American democracy. And my my only point is there are other there are other fundamental rights: the rights to freedom from discrimination, uh, the so, right to the right to vote, the right to you know the rights to protect the public health and the public safety. Um, those are also those rights. Are and, I, and I don't want to say those um, you know carry too far. I think we need to be reasonable and analytical and. Also, you know, to your point about you know about civil discourse, um, again, we need to have more freedom of the press, and we need to count more on, um, on on public information being accurate. We've seen you know all kinds of allegations of fake news that aren't true. You know, we need to have good journalism, good reporting, and for purveyors, folks to be. It's usually the purveyors of fake news who accuse the mainstream media of fake. news. I have found that. I've uh, also found, you know, alternative facts by the same purveyors, um, you know, justifying all kinds of discriminatory right. policies. Um, but bottom line, mm -hmm. you are confident that we're going to work all this out and our democracy will get healthy again after some period of time. I think it's going to take a whole lot of work to tell you the truth, right? So. Um, I think that uh, this is this is an excellent project, and we should all keep fighting for fundamental rights. And uh, you know, we're supposed to be the beacon of democracy. We are in a crisis in our democracy, and one of the main reasons for the crisis that we're at this crossroads is really white supremacy. Um, you know, people can see the next generation is more racially diverse, and we hear all of this anti-immigrant speech and all of this speech against African Americans that's, you know, been there all along, but it's gotten a voice. You know, we, we see the, the, the battle for really the heart of American democracy playing out in elections um, with a president who um, doesn't want everyone to be included in democracy and doesn't want some people to have free speech and even in, at the state and local level. So the Virginia gubernatorial race in 2016, you know, is very symbolic of that. We have one side that's for the Confederate monuments, that um, is for gerrymandering, is for voter ID, is extremely anti-immigrant um, and is conflated undocumented immigrants with gangs, which is something that um, is completely untrue, and I have to say, you know, I'm from a family that has immigrants in it, and the folks in my family are not gang members. Um, from Guatemala, it doesn't mean they're gang members. Um, and on the other hand, we have, you know, another version of democracy um, that's, um, that, that, that has yet to really be fully realized for the next generation. I would say both sides need to work on not falling into the so trap that, of, of pitting us against each, each other in our so country. So that's a form of democracy that's more inclusive. An inclusive democracy. And to have that inclusiveness, must we constrain racist speech or forms of free speech that we're unhappy with? So yes to the first one, we need to constrain racist speech. We need to do that in a constitutional manner. It depends very much on the setting. So for public school children, there's no place for racist speech in public school, aside from possibly learning about how it is that that has become um, no longer acceptable in our society uh, because the, the foundation of our democracy is public education and equal access to public education. And, and, and that's, um, again, a, a Supreme Court decision. Um, that's Brown versus the Board of Education. So yes, there need to be some constraints on the interpretation of every single one of the fundamental rights in our country in the Bill of Rights, including speech. Randomly saying- In order saying, to promote an inclusive, peaceful society. Yes, and at, in order to promote an inclusive democracy and an inclusive and peaceful society. I would say that there are limits on that theory. Uh, it's not every speech that makes someone unhappy. That should, that should be restricted in any way. Any restriction should be reasonable, and it should be directly tied to you know, those principles that we're I, talking about. I have a student right now who draws a distinction between hate speech and disagreeable speech. Yes. And she says if we could just figure out a framework 
to tell the difference between those two, we, we could solve a problem. Uh, I think that that's, that's a good theory, but I would amend it, I'll give her a friendly amendment to that. So it's not a dualistic exercise. It's not as if there's hate speech, which is easy to see, um, should be restricted and doesn't belong in public spaces. And then there's everything else. Um, there's a gray area in between. There's discriminatory speech that can create a hostile environment, particularly in educational spaces. Um, so. Um, there's, there's, uh, you know, there, there, there's an in-between space that we need to be very careful about. Um, and that's where arguably you could have a slippery slope. Really, either way, we've gone along a slippery slope of you know, accepting the Confederate flag on license plates when, in fact, it doesn't have to be there. Uh, so so uh, I would just uh, congratulate um, you, know, you all on your project. It's a very important project. And you know, seeing how these rights um, intertwine and intersect in order to bring us to a, a future democracy that's more inclusive and respectful of, of, of every right, including free speech. Kathy, thanks very much for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. We've been discussing the conflict between free speech and other democratic values with Catherine Culleton Gonzalez from Demos. To learn more about Georgetown University's free speech project, please visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.